Thanks so much. Welcome to the Halftime Report. I'm Scott Wagner. Front and center this hour, the Nasdaq's moment of truth. NVIDIA earnings just one day away. And the investment committee sizing up what is at stake. They are making some key trades today. We'll get to all of that. Joining me for the hour, Josh Brown, Stephanie Link, Bryn Talkington, and Farmer Jim Labenthal. To the markets we go at some nice price action today. We've gone positive on the S&P and the Dow. We can check the NASDAQ, which is still fighting it out for the green. It's still modestly in the red. Um, but we are trying to work our way back towards 40K. We are waiting for NVIDIA tomorrow night. And how about Apple making a nice move today as well? So we're going to get to all of that. I do want to begin, though, with you, Josh, because you have some interesting new moves that you have made in this market. And the first one is that you bought Corning, okay, GLW, which is trading right around a 52-week high. It's like a, I don't know, pennies away from that, on pace for its seventh straight day of gain. So amidst this momentum, why are you buying it now? So it might be a little bit short-term overbought, but this is the type of technical uh, situation that you know viewers of the show know that I'm personally looking for. I'm looking for really good companies that are at some sort of an inflection point where the, the buyers are overwhelming the sellers, and that's exactly what's happening here. This is one of the oldest companies in America, 170 years of innovation. They're in all sorts of verticals, life sciences, mobile phone and computer displays, environmental, specialty materials. But the real driver here, Judge, is optical fiber. So if, if people were around during the first dot-com build-out, one of the things they would remember is that Corning was one of the hottest stocks in the world. That whole thing is happening again, but now with AI. And you really can't do the types of stuff that the hyperscalers want to do without huge orders for optical fiber. And I think the inflection in what we're seeing with this chart is, is exactly that. Um, there, there's been excess inventory at the phone carriers of optical fiber. That's being uh, worked off. And now, management just said on April 30th, you see this big gap up after the earnings report, that Q1 would represent the low point of the year. That inventory in the system that's kept the stock at a discount has now been worked off. And they're starting to see the beginning, the beginning of AI-related orders. And I think that this is the type of stock that could get rediscovered. So it just hit our best stocks in the market list. RSI is about 79. So short term, it is overbought. But I think it'll hold that post-earnings gap, which is about $31 a share. So as long as that rising 50-day stays above the 200-day, I want to be long here. You got a 3% dividend yield, which I think will act as a cushion. You got 13 years of consecutive dividend increases. You've got a company with the longest debt maturities in the whole S&P 500 with an average of 23 years. And you've got this huge wave of spending, not just from the hyperscalers and AI, but the broadband equity access deployment uh, program, which is a government program called BEAD, um, could be incremental, another $42 billion to expand access to high-speed broadband all over the country. Corning is going to be a player there, too. Okay, so we see that stock on the move. The other stock you bought is SN, another one trading right around a 52-week high. That's Shark Ninja. Tell us what uh, caught your eye about this one. This one's more of a flyer. Um, I, de it's, I definitely wouldn't touch it right at this price. I'm in it uh, lower than here. This is a company that's based in Needham, Massachusetts, but very few people are aware of it because it got bought by a Chinese billionaire who then spun it back out in 2023, uh, making it a, a, a U.S. stock once again. And when they did their IPO in August, Chinese stocks were at their lows. People just didn't want anything that had to do with uh, China. But this company is one of the hottest brands in American appliances, the Ninja Blender and the Shark Vacuum Cleaner. If you've bought a blender or a vacuum at any point over the last couple of years, there's a very good chance you bought a Ninja or a Shark. They have been expanding into other categories like outdoor, like skin care, believe it or not, hair care. The company's just on fire. And uh, this is a, a company doing $3.7 billion in revenue. RSI is about 80. That's scorching hot. I would probably let it cool off a little bit before establishing <coughs> a new position. It's an 18 forward PE. Earnings per share growth this year 
expected something like 20%. So that's the story with Shark Ninja. All right, I want to get those out of the way before we you know, talk about really what's at stake over the next 24 hours, Bryn. And you know, we know it's looming with NVIDIA earnings. You're obviously in the stock. Interesting price action today, too, in the NASDAQ, which is attempting to go positive. And if it gets there, it's going to be because of stocks like NVIDIA, which, you know, back, well, right hugging the flat line today, but right around that 950 level. How about Apple, that comeback that that stock's had above 192? What do you think's really at stake with these earnings that are looming? I mean, I think the earnings Oscars are tomorrow, and Best Picture will go to NVIDIA. I mean, the, we all know the estimates are 242% revenue growth with 412% earnings growth. And so I think they're going to continue to have another crushing quarter. I think between Jensen and Satya, they're like two rock stars that he's going to have an awesome earnings call. He's going to sprinkle in a bunch of other companies uh, that will have a halo effect tomorrow when, the, when, the earning, when, 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 when after the earnings come out. And so I just think this stock continues to be somewhat underappreciated. I mean, it's up 90 percent year to date. So I, I say underappreciated. <laughs> yeah, but, underappreciated. But, 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 I, can't but, help but I can't help but laugh. <laughs> well, let me, let me explain, put some context. <laughs> yesterday, uh, Dan Niles was on uh, one, of the, one of the shows, and he had a really good point that NVIDIA is actually trading at 15 percent below its five-year PE average. And so that's what I'm talking about. And so I still think that there's this sentiment that sometime in the next quarter or two quarters, NVIDIA is going to start acting like a traditional cyclical semiconductor company where all of a sudden earnings and revenues start growing at a slower pace and decelerating. I think that absolutely will happen, but I don't think it's going to happen until maybe the back half of this year or 2025. So I think you'll see a one-handle a thousand, you know, a thousand on the stock before you see before you see at eight hundred. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting twenty-four hours uh, for certainly holders of Nvidia like you and and Josh and and Jim. Um, what what do you feel like is at stake as we look ahead to tomorrow? Uh, well, a lot's at stake, and the question is what's going to happen. I totally agree with Bryn's assessment of the company itself. Um, as far as the cyclicality, I, I do think the cyclicality will assert itself, but not in the next one to two quarters. I think maybe in the next three to four quarters. That's obviously not the near term. But, Scott, to answer your question, as I think about the stock right now, I think about this quarter, you know, the estimates from a year ago. And remember, it was a year ago when they had that first blowout quarter that just all of a sudden made people like me understand this was a different company uh, than the usual. Those estimates for this quarter are up 230% from a year ago. That's a lot. Okay, They're up 20% uh, in the year to date. Mm -hmm. And my point on this, we all know what the stock has done, is I would not be surprised, again, uh, to Bryn's point, if you have a beaten raise. Uh, uh, next, you know, tomorrow afternoon. I would not be surprised if the stock popped at, in the after hours. And I also wouldn't be surprised if at the end of the week it actually trailed off a little bit. Let me be clear. I'm not negative on the stock. I'm long the stock. But there is a point where you have to ask how much of this is priced in. Yeah. I know the earnings estimates going out the next five years are 31% annualized growth. That's going to be hard to come by for the next five years. Next two to three quarters? Sure. The, the growth uh, now versus then, so to speak, I think we have a graphic to kind of show you what, what is expected. Earnings are expected to be five times greater than they were last year. Mm -hmm. Revenues are poised to more than triple from a year ago. There, there we go. Uh, that's on our wall that, yes, we, we think it's the most impactful earnings report on the S&P right now, just given what that stock has done. It's a you know, near double already in five months and how much it's responsible for the, look, I mean, there's a fair amount of hype around AI, but they're realizing it too in the way they're monetizing it. So that's why, Steph, there's, there's so much at stake, especially when some are suggesting, boy, the NASDAQ has gone from oversold to overbought uh, seemingly overnight. Yeah, it, well, look, NVIDIA is 5% weight of the S&P 500, but obviously AI touches so many different companies throughout technology, throughout other sectors in the market, throughout the economy, and we're in the second or third innings. I think there are a lot of various different ways you can play that theme. Uh, I'm not in NVIDIA, as you know, but I am in other names that have done quite well over the last two years um, as well. So I think there are, you've got to pick your spots. I think the expectations are quite high for NVIDIA, especially 
simply because the hyperscalers gave you that information. They, they told you that the four big hyperscalers, Amazon, Meta, Google, and Microsoft, are going to spend $177 billion in CapEx for cloud and, and generative AI this year alone. That's just enormous, right? And then global CapEx is actually gro going to grow $225 billion this year alone. So mm -hmm. clearly that benefits a lot of companies. NVIDIA is included in that. Um, I think as a result, if let's just say it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't meet these aggressive expectations and the stock falls, I really do think you're going to see buyers come in. So I don't think it's going to be down for long, especially given the growth rates that we just heard uh, that, you know, Bryn was talking about, Jimmy uh, was talking about as well. So um, I, I, I'm just choosing to play it a different way, but certainly it is a very, very important report. Yeah. There's no doubt. By, by the way, Evercore ISI, long and strong into the print, outperform 1160 is the price target. So, Josh, as, as you know, you're, you're, the, you're our guy on NVIDIA. Um, how good does this have to be? We, we know it's we know the bar is high. How could it not be? Stocks, uh, you know, up 200 and something percent over the last year, up almost a double, as I said, in some five months. The bar has been high, Playboy. And you know what? Every quarter, we're told this is the quarter that something's going to go horribly wrong, and it just hasn't happened yet. Um, so it, look at the last time they reported, which was February. Earnings per share came in at $5.16. The estimate was four sixty-four. Do you have any idea how many times earnings were revised higher to get to that four sixty-four, And they still stepped right over it like it wasn't even there. 22.1 billion in revenue versus 20.6. They crushed that too. The stock went up 16 and a half percent. In response, it had its market cap growth in that single day of 276 billion. The most any company has ha had in, in one day market cap growth ever. So like, it's not like Nvidia is like, oh, it's, it's pretty shaky historically. We know what happens if they come in better than expected. Um, now. To, to the earlier point being made, NVIDIA is already the third best performer in the S&P. In fact, the only two better performers, SMCI is up 224%, Vista Corp, which is a utility, is up 140, NVIDIA is up 90, but all three of them are up on AI stuff. So, like, it's, it's not underappreciated by the market how good NVIDIA is. Oh, so I'm no, trying no to maintain question. a balance, I, I'm trying to maintain a balanced point of view I highly doubt this company will come out, beat earnings, and then have anything other than positive things to say but, uh, uh, you know, about the second half of the year, given the, the rate at which people and corporations are spending on this stuff. What we don't know is how much is already priced in. And that, frankly, to me, is the real thing that's going to be revealed tonight. Yeah, been been crazy tomorrow. Been oh, crazy. Tomorrow um, yeah. The stock, you know, mm -hmm. goes down to 750, and now it's a 950, seemingly in, in, in you know snap of the fingers. But I like what Steph had to say. That you know, look, she she doesn't own Nvidia, okay, for whatever reason, missed it, valuation too high. Mm -hmm. But she points out Broadcom and and these other stocks, like Bank of America today, talks about their top five U.S. semi picks exposed to AI. Broadcom second on the list, right, Steph? So I get yeah. all the hype around NVIDIA, and I know you probably wish you were able to capture that kind of upside, but, but you're not there. You're in other names, and there are other ways to play it, and if that doesn't underscore it, I don't know what does. Yeah, and it's a little bit cheaper than NVIDIA, but it's not nearly as cheap as, as it was when I was buying it. Scott, I was buying this like two and a half, three years ago, and it was trading at 14 times forward estimates, and it yielded 4%. That's actually one of the reasons I bought it, because it was yielding so much, and the, and the free cash flow is so, is so strong. Um, and so fast forward to today, you're at 30 times forward. However, their part of AI as, is going to go from 10% of the company, of their semi-business, last year to 25% by 2025. That's huge growth, too. And I do think it's uh, somewhat underappreciated. Um, and again, they benefit as well from the hyperscale spending. And they have the best in class margins, free cash flow of, tw of 12 billion this year. They will in, in, the, in the fourth quarter, they will increase their buyback again. They have the VMware acquisition, which helps them in terms of software, recurring revenues and higher margins. And they do have best in class margins. So I do think that there is a lot to look forward to with regards to Broadcom. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it doesn't get the splashes as, as NVIDIA does, but that's fine by me.
City says today they're wildly bullish on, on semis. Um, they list Lamb Research, by the way, on that list, which you just bought yeah. more of. Tell us. Yeah, I mean, this is a one that's lagged, um, the, uh, the SMH. Uh, it's up 22% this year, so it's not bad, but the SMH is up 34%. Applied Materials, its biggest competitor, is also up 34%. So it is lagged because we're all waiting for NAND, WFE, Wafer Fab Equipment Spend, to recover. This is going to be a second half 2024 situation and a really big tailwind for 2025. And we're starting to see green shoots in NAND WFE with regards to supply demand. ASPs are increasing. Utilization rates are rising. So I want to get ahead of this turn. Um, in the meantime, the company has done a really good job in terms of gross margins. And of course, today they announced the big buyback in the stock split. That typically is positive for a, sh for a stock. I'm surprised it's not up more, but I think that the underappreciation is the NAND recovery. It's coming. It's just a matter of timing, mm -hmm. and I want to get ahead of that. Yeah, $10 billion buyback, 10 to 1 split, too. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, by the way, that city note, they're also bullish on applied materials, AMAT, in yep. the uh, semi-equipment space, and that's yours. Yeah, and everything that Steffi just said about wafer fab equipment spend applies to AMAT as well. I think for holders of AMAT or LAM research, we're often wondering, well, geez, should we really be in ASML? I mean, that's the, the, the monolithic uh, monopoly. But the pricing of the shares is much different for AMAT, and I just, I'm more comfortable there. I'm also more comfortable because AMAT touches more of the actual chain by which uh, semiconductors are built. Um, but regardless, whether it's AMAT, LAM research, or ASML, we're building semiconductor plants all over the place. It's not just here in the U.S. It's Japan. It's India. Um, and all of these companies are going to benefit. Boy, I'd love to touch on Qualcomm. Will you I was just going to bring that up. Okay. Go ahead. Because I mean, I, look, mm -hmm. this is what, a stock. No, because chips have gone crazy over the last month, too. And Qualcomm's on the list of maybe the third best performer, up 25%. It's a record high today. Yeah. You've got Teradyne up 44%, NXP up 26 Texas Instruments 24 We talked about NVIDIA, obviously. KLA 10 Corp. Uh, Taiwan Semi, Micron, Marvell, and yes, your, your Qualcomm has done quite and, well. And, and thanks for that, because, you know, Scott, uh, the reason I'm a little eager on it is because I think everybody knows this stock was in the desert, right, in 22 and 23. And, and if you're an investor, a long-term investor, you're looking and you're saying, what's going on, man? There's real, there's real intellectual property at Qualcomm. This is very similar, again, to Stephanie uh, with, with uh, Broadcom, that this is a different way of playing AI. You saw the announcement yesterday that they're providing, Qualcomm is providing AI chips uh, for Microsoft's AI enabled uh, computers. I mean, that's that's huge. And this is in addition to edge computing on smartphones uh, as far as AI capabilities go. Uh, so there's a reason that the stock is breaking out. And I just want to say one more thing. You know, yeah. I remember recommending this stock in early 2022 at 190, and then it went into the desert. And folks, I felt bad about that. I did. But if you stuck with it, as I have, and if you stuck with me, you're, you're now reaping the rewards. Stick with the farmer. Thank you. Is that your message? That's the message. Um, I do want to hit Palo Alto, our chart of the day. We don't have direct ownership there, but obviously it was disappointing after the earnings report. And it does bring to mind cyber stocks. I don't need an opinion on Palo Alto from, you know, people who don't own it. Stock's down about 3%, and that's a recovery. You look at the intraday from mm -hmm. where it was after earnings yesterday from where it opened this morning. We'll take that as a W, I think, if you're, if you're in shares in Palo Alto. The analyst, yeah, thank you. By the way, join me 3 o'clock, as I said on Closing Bell today. Liz Ann Saunders is going to be with me, along with Gene Munster and Matthew Boss of J.P. Morgan, top retail analyst in the space. So we'll look ahead to, to all of that. Uh, let's do final trades. Steph, what do you got? So at Bank of America, just after J.P. Morgan increased their net interest income number for the second time yesterday, Bank of America gets 50% of their total revenues from NII. I think it bodes well for the stock at 1.2 times book. Been biting my tongue for the last 59 minutes and 30 seconds. Josh Brown, did, did you ride a horse to work today? <laughs> uh, what are I you? did. The Jolly Rancher, uh, that's your new nickname. Moderna. Moderna, uh, new 52-week high here. On my radar, I'm not long the stock. No real resistance until that 200-day moving average at about 160. Okay. Bryn, what do you got? Uh, Palantir. This company's at a huge inflection point. They just had their sixth uh, quarter of positive okay. gap earnings. Uh, great name to go into NVIDIA. The, from the Oracle. rancher to the farmer. Oracle. All right, thank you. I'll see you on uh, the Closing Bell, the exchanges now. All right, Kel, thanks so much. Welcome to Closing Bell. I'm Scott Wapner, live from Post 9 here at the New York Stock Exchange. This make or break hour begins with Apple and NVIDIA. On a tear lately, it's a big reason why the NASDAQ has surged to new record highs. Of course, the big event of the week, NVIDIA reporting earnings tomorrow in overtime. And yes, we are counting you down to that. 
so much at stake for the tech trade, perhaps the markets overall. We're going to ask our experts over this final stretch what's really riding on it, including Schwab's Liz Ann Saunders. going to join me momentarily. In the meantime, your scorecard with 60 minutes to go in regulation looks exactly like that. We are green across the board, but there's definitely a wait and see from the majors today ahead of those key earnings tomorrow. Yields, they're lower across the curve today. We continue to watch that, obviously. A lot of Fed speak to talk about, too. It does take us to our talk of the tape. With stocks trading around record highs, is it time to lean into this bull market or step a bit back? Let's ask Lizanne Saunders. She is Schwab's chief investment strategist and, as you can see, joins us live. It's nice to see you again. Welcome back. Well, thank you very much. Happy Tuesday, Scott. Yeah, you as well. What do you think about that Thanks. question? Time to lean in or maybe take a, you know, take a few toes out of the market? Well, we have nine trillion dollars of uh, of client assets. I'd ask, you know, who's the client, what the structure of the portfolio, whether they are on some sort of periodic rebalancing schedule. I think periodic rebalancing is just a beautiful exercise, especially if you make it portfolio based as opposed to structuring it simply around the calendar, which a lot of investors do. And it, you know, it forces us to do a version of what we know we're supposed to, which is add low and trim uh, high. So I, I think that that's always uh, an important important part of the, the discipline of investing is that rebalancing as opposed to trying to time the market in the short term. Sure. You, you know where I'm getting at, though. Um, you know, we've had a great rebound from, from yeah. the April lows. Um, does it feel like there's more to go to this bull market? Yeah, but I think that there has been a lot more churn under the surface that I think helps maybe tell a, a more accurate story of all the uncertainties with which we're, we're very familiar, whether it's Fed policy, inflation, the backdrop for the economy, some signs of weakening in economic data. You know, you, you talked in the lead in about the NASDAQ. NASDAQ is up 10 percent in the past month, hasn't had more than a 7 or 8 percent uh, drawdown, maximum drawdown year to date. But the average member within the NASDAQ has had a 35 percent drawdown. So there is a lot of rotation and churn going on under the surface. You just have these cap-weighted indexes biased so significantly by some of the mega cap names, not just the Magnificent Seven anymore, that that's keeping the indexes afloat. But there is a lot more churn under the surface. Is it interesting that you're starting to see small caps try to, you know, claw their way back into some semblance of a short-term leadership position? So I, I, I think the market has the potential to, to broaden out a bit here. But we do need earnings to continue to come in well, because last year was all about multiple expansion without any uh, benefit from earnings. Um, I, I think earnings do need to continue to catch up to where multiples are. Well, you give me a perfect segue to NVIDIA. I mean, I know you don't talk individual <laughs> stocks, but I know you're thinking about, because everybody is sure. thinking about what the, about it. Yeah, what the implications are yeah. of this earnings report tomorrow. What, what so, do you think is really uh, yeah. riding on it? I, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to talk about whether I, they beat or not, but clearly the whisper numbers continue to edge higher. It is important to remember that, you know, the overall tech sector has a blended earnings growth rate, meaning all the companies that have already reported their actual results blended with the companies that have yet to report of, I think it's 23 or 24 percent for the sector. But that drops down to 11 percent if you just exclude NVIDIA. So it, that's just a, a numerical way to see how much is, is riding on this. And, um, I, you know, they, they, they continue to, to beat every single quarter. But, you know, we have to, I guess, be careful about extrapolating as far into the future as, you know, years from now. So uh, could it represent a risk at some point just from an expectations bar perspective? Yeah. But whether that's tomorrow, I have no idea. I'm not an sure. analyst. Sure. But um, would, would you think that earnings can be good enough to get a lot more out of the bull market? I mean, Rick Reeder was on with me of BlackRock the other day and suggested that they are good enough and could still be good enough that you might be able to get 10 to 15 percent more out of equities in 2024. Now, many would sit back and say, wow, that sounds like a really massive amount of return to still produce. Does that sound well, outlandish? No, it doesn't. But I think the background uh, conditions need to be supportive, too. So multiples are should never be used as any kind of market timing tool. Market could be expensive, get more expensive, stay expensive. And it doesn't represent some in or out uh, call on the market associated with valuations. However, where there is a very close relationship to valuations historically, whether they're on the higher end of the historical range or lower end, is the inflation backdrop. Maybe, not coincidentally, the sweet spot 
for inflation is right around the Fed's target in terms of historically that has been the inflation backdrop that has been supportive of higher than average valuations. And it gets worse when you go into deflation zones. It obviously also gets worse when you go into hyperinflation zones. So I think both yields and inflation need to also cooperate um, alongside a strong earnings growth. It's also important to remember that the, the revenue data is nowhere near as strong as the earnings data. So this has been a profit margin story. You've had better than expected beat rates and percent by which companies have beaten on the bottom line, but you have lower than average beat rates and percent by which companies have beaten on the revenue line. And revenues are only growing at about the pace of inflation. So that's something to be mindful of, that that profit margin story needs to persist as we go into the rest of this year. You mentioned things like the Russell you know, rallying. Russell's up 8% in the last month. So we're really talking about the line in the sand being those April lows. What do you make of this so-called everything rally? Small caps, tech, gold, copper, Bitcoin, you know, bonds. I mean, the you know, 10-year yield is down 30 bips in, in that period of time, too, since, you know, kind of Powell talked us off the ledge, uh, the Fed chair. What do you think about that? I think that it tells you that there is still a lot of liquidity uh, in terms of a backdrop. It also suggests that financial conditions are relatively easy. That's in contrast to some of the commentary we hear from the Fed. And certainly Powell has been getting a lot more questions about you talk about policy being restrictive, yet you don't see it in the data in traditional financial conditions indexes that that we all track. And I think that that is part of the reason why you have this pseudo everything rally in areas um, aside from just the equity market. When you take a look at some of the sectors that have you know done pretty well, like when you see utilities, for example, up 11 percent in a month, and I know that now everybody is talking about them as the, you know, the, the next AI derivative play, AI. <laughs> right? Um, I don't yeah. know if you agree with that or not. Maybe you do, yeah, and I, I mean, want you to tell I, me, but I, what do you I think? I do, but I, I forget who said it recently, um, but that, you know, AI is everywhere uh, except in the numbers. And uh, you're not really definitively seeing it, but everybody is trying to figure out what are the longer term plays aside from the, you know, the direct infrastructure plays associated with AI. And then you add to it the necessity of boosting the power grid globally, not just for AI reasons, but the lack of investment, but also move toward green tech and EV. So I think there's there there in terms of the long-term fundamental support, but you have to worry at some point about valuations in a segment of the market that is ostensibly value. This is one of those potential issues where utilities don't generally find themselves living in the growth indexes, so therefore <laughs> they're in the value indexes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's true value there from a multi multiple standpoint. So um, I think there could be some sentiment uh, risk at some point. We have yeah. it rated, we have utilities rated market perform. So, you know, another word for, for neutral. So we don't have it as an outperform or an underperform. Sure. I mean, it's been kind of a broad based um, recovery from those lows. I, I'm looking at, you mm -hmm. know, staples we don't necessarily talk about in an offensive way either. They're up almost 5%. Discretionary, we have serious questions about the health of the consumer, yep. up almost 5%. Healthcare, not doing all that much, up almost 5%. You know, on a year-to-date basis, you know, most sectors are, I think, I think 10 out of 11 sectors are in positive territory, uh, with the exception of, of REITs. But you do still see these leadership shifts that occur over shorter-term uh, periods of time. But there is generally that cyclical bias. Even in the case of utilities, which we think of as classically defensive, there's that, you know, perceived or actual growth play that's part of, I think, why utilities have done well. I don't think there's they're doing well, nor consumer staples for that typical sort of defensive play. In addition, momentum as a factor, which is more of a concept than a fundamental factor, continues to do really well, which simply means that stocks that have been doing well continue to do well. So you get, you do get some performance chasing that happens in an environment where momentum as a factor is doing well. 
Lizanne, I appreciate it as always. It's nice to see you. Well, let's bring in Lauren Goodwood of New York Life Investments and Eric Wallerstein of Yardeni Research. Good to have you both. Lauren, let me just turn your attention for a moment to NVIDIA as well. Like, what do you feel is, is really at stake tomorrow, not only for the overall tech trade, but the market at large, given the magnitude of the rally we've had back led by tech? Everything's at stake is the answer. I mean, not just on the upside in the sense that this earnings environment has been really constructive and important part of the rally so far, but also on the potential downside. I mean, if we look back to the 2000s, it didn't take a big uh, downward turn in earnings to pop the bubble. It took Cisco reporting closer to 50 percent growth instead of 60 percent growth to do it. So these numbers matter a lot. If we can pretend that, you know, we we don't have to care about an NVIDIA, which isn't the case. The environment for the rally to continue the, is, is quite strong. We've had a good earnings season. Uh, we have a Fed that's, that's hell-bent on being dovish. And we have an um, employment environment that's still very strong. Until any of those factors reverse, which I don't see a reason for that to be the case in the next couple of months, this is a tactical all systems go for the, for the bull market. Wow, all systems go. Uh, so, Eric, the, the everything rally, as, as we're calling it, continues? Yeah, listen, forward earnings definitely are supporting stocks. And as Lizanne mentioned, uh, rising profit margins for the S&P 500. The broadening out with the equal weight index and even, you know, SMID caps is just kind of starting. You know, small caps are still under pressure from higher rates. But uh, we see no reason with a tight labor market, rising real incomes and just more spending that uh, corporate profits have to fall anytime soon. Interesting. So it's going to be an earnings-driven story because you guys are looking, you know, you, you tend to look out further than most and put out some reasonably lofty targets, I think is fair to say, including one that you put out. You guys put out something big earlier uh, in the week. Remind me what that was. I think yeah, it was so like, Dow, um, like Dow 60,000 or something like that. Yeah. So listen, for the next few years, we have 5,400, which we're nearly at for the S&P 500 this year. Um, and then we're at 6,000 for next year, and then finishing up 2026 at 6,500. And again, that's earnings driven. Uh, you know, this whole roaring 2020 scenario right now is our highest probability outcome. We attribute like a 60% likelihood of that. Uh, there are some other risks. You know, we have a 20% scenario of a, you know, a melt up in the stock market. And if the Fed kind of preliminarily cuts, we could see that. Melt ups are fine. You just have to know when to get out. And then there's that 20% scenario where there's another uh, revival in inflation. Um, but for now, we see productivity growth really being a strong driver of real incomes and for the next several years, driving the market higher. You don't think what we're currently experiencing is a quote unquote melt up? It's supported by earnings and real income, so I wouldn't say that. You know, valuations could be a little frothy at 20, but there's no reason that that's too expensive for the large caps, especially with, you know, what mega cap, what the mega cap eight have done, including NVIDIA. I mean, it may not be, you know, expensive for the mega caps, but, you know, 20 and a half uh, as a multiple to some seems a little expensive. Yeah, look, I mean, Lizanne was right. Valuations aren't a great market timing tool, but one of the things we've noticed recently, the past couple of weeks, the equity risk premium has moved negative, which doesn't tell you anything for the next couple of months. As I mentioned, we do think that the case for, for equity is strong at the moment, but what it does tell you really consistently over a longer term basis, think even 10 years out, mm -hmm. that the trade off between equity and bonds doesn't quite make sense anymore. And so that supports one of our highest conviction views, which you and I have talked about a lot, which is taking some of the gains we've seen in equity, activating it in high yield, where you still get the benefit of the bull market we're seeing, but some higher income stream in the meantime. What about taking some of the gains you've gotten in cash and, and use your word, activating it into equities? I mean, that's what some are banking on to get you to that next leg. We're actually moving cash into short duration fixed income for a couple of reasons. One is that you still have, we think, an interesting risk reward profile similar to uh, the benefit that you would see just putting money to work in equity or other asset classes. But the real reason is that regardless of the, the path or the exact timeline that the Fed is trying to take, it's very clear that their next move is going to be a cut. And so investors that have benefited from higher rates in cash in the last couple of years aren't going to benefit from those same rates moving forward. And so if you look at the maturity wall and fixed income that's coming in the next couple of years, a two to three year short duration fixed income play is a really nice way to lock in that higher income stream for the next couple of years. Eric, do you think we get cuts this year? And uh, from talking with Ed, you know, 
over there on, on a regular basis. It doesn't even feel like you guys care if we get them or not. You're still positive on the market nonetheless. Yeah, we think the economy can handle higher rates. It's definitely demonstrated that. Uh, we don't think the Fed should cut. Uh, if they do cut one or two times this year, it would be to maintain that kind of real restrictive um, rate where inflation falls and thus we got to cut on a nominal basis to keep real rates where they are. We think that would definitely up the chances of a, a melt up in the stock market. So we don't think there's any reason to cut. Um, you know, but if they do, we'll be revising our expectations for uh, the next few years. How are you guys thinking about, you know, whether the consumer needs to be worried about Lauren or not? We got Matthew Boss of J.P. Morgan coming up later in the show. He's the top retail analyst. Target earnings are tomorrow. There are a lot of things going on with, within within that space. The the sector, what year to date, is up two percent. Does it get better? Look, I think the reality for the consumer is that the story is incredibly bifurcated. This is something we're seeing for companies as well. Lower income consumers are starting to struggle. Middle and upper income consumers aren't. And that's a challenge for the Fed because it means that inflationary pressures are, are still part of the problem. Even some of the very anecdotal evidence we have of price cuts from certain companies really aren't hitting the, the mark when it comes to being able to cut rates. And that's one of the things that we've heard a lot from the endless slew of Fed speak this week is that we've got a couple of months a better data before they can even think about moving Yeah, that's that what direction. Waller was, sorry to interrupt, what's what Waller was, was telling Steve Leesman today, too. He's like, I need, a, you know, several months uh, before we're, we're willing to, uh, to entertain the cut. It's been good talking to you. Thank you for being here. That's Lauren Goodwin. Eric, I'll talk to you soon as well. Thank you. Thanks, Hello God. and welcome to Blue Cloud Trading. It is Tuesday, May 21st. It's almost the close. It's 3.53 p.m. and just seven minutes left before the market closes. We just witnessed Josh Brown talking about Shark Ninja in this last episode of the Halftime Report. What's interesting about this specific stock and Josh's comment was that this was one of the stocks, folks, that was in our members-only videos. What videos, you ask? Well, as you know, my channel here, we do have you know the videos that you see on a daily basis, right, available to subscribers, but I also have member only exclusive videos and uh, you can see the list right here that stock was brought up on april on the april 28th uh end of week on april 28th all right so it was in this video right here and um it i mean it, it's really outperforming it has done really well since this date right here you can see so look basically it's moved up approximately 21.79 in the last 25.7 days. You can see that in that box that popped up to your left at the very bottom of that box. Now, um, Shark Ninja is doing really well. It's still looking very strong. This is the weekly chart we're looking at on the daily chart. Look at this beautiful chart. And this is, by the way, just one of over 30 plus stocks that I cover in the member only videos. If you haven't become a member yet, something to consider. Um, you can do it easily by coming to the YouTube channel and clicking on the link right there, right? If you click on that link at the very front, it will bring you into this section segment right here. You would have to become either a Blue Cloud Trader or Blue Cloud Legend to access those videos, those exclusive member only videos, okay? So anyway, now that I got that whole uh, promotional thing out of the way, why don't we get into the stocks and see how the markets did. The Dow today, it's still moving, like I said. We still have a few more minutes. It's 3.55 p.m. Uh, it's up 2.1%. NASDAQ is up 0.23. S&P up 0.27. And the Russell 2000 is very flat. It's around point, you know, negative 0 0.07. You know, they're basically just waiting for the uh, earnings, I think, tomorrow on uh, NVIDIA. And we'll see. NVIDIA was up 0.53% today. Microsoft was up. Apple, Google. Amazon was down 0.24. Tesla was up 6.68. The banks did pretty well today, like JP Morgan, right? Bank of America and Citigroup, they were all up. The railroads didn't do so well. And let's see what else. The healthcare stocks were kind of mixed here. The consumer discretionary and consumer, I'm sorry, consumer defensive stocks did really well. Okay. And utilities did pretty good. Let's take a look at the charts. Let's start off with the SPY. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, we're going to look at the daily charts in this uh, 
particular episode here because I only go over the weekend, the weekly charts, mostly on the weekends, right? And uh, the weekly, the weekly charts, the candle hasn't formed. This is a weekly chart. This candle has not formed yet, all right? We're only into Tuesday right now, so we don't can't really make a, a definitive decision um, based on on this candle. So that's why we focus mostly on the daily charts, all right, during the week. Right now, it's looking ultra bullish, obviously, up 0.22% today, still moving up. The QQQ ETF on the daily chart, you can see today, another up day, up 0.20%, but enough actually to close above a very important level. This, the high of that reversal candle, okay? That was a uh, inverse little hammer, tiny, you know, reversal candle. I had circled this the previous week. Uh, and uh, it occurred back on Thursday, May 16th, okay? This has now been canceled. It's no longer something that we have to worry about. And so there's a continuation that's happening, which is uh, what we want to see. The ADX is still strong. The positive DI line is still above the negative DI line. This is what we want. We want a high momentum um, uptrend, and that's what we have with this. The ADX is moving up, so that's that's really strong. The Dow, DIA ETF, this one yesterday closed under the 398.58 level and today popped up above it. It seems to be sort of in a, uh, just creating a base, really. It's like a resting stop. I guess that's the best way to describe it. Um, so as long as price remains within this little boxy area here, I think there's nothing really to do. We are still above the Tenkinson, Kijinson. Everything looks bullish overall. I wouldn't be too worried about it on the weekly chart. You can see that we're holding up above that level. So, yeah. How about the Russell 2000? Now, the Russell 2000, it was down 0.10%, but sim you know, very similarly, we're not we're not getting a lot of movement these last few days because there's an expectation uh, that we're waiting for the earnings from Nvidia and that's probably what's going to trigger this market, okay? I mean, it holds a very large position in the S&P 500. It's one of the largest stocks and it will trigger the other I believe at least semiconductors, right? In either a positive or negative way. That's why I'm waiting to see what happens tomorrow before I, you know, add to my uh, current position. Okay, so let's see. Let's take a look at the sectors next. Now, we'll actually start off with the VIX. The VIX is still moving, dropping down. This is the uh, market volatility index. What it represents essentially is the fear in the markets. And when this is declining, the markets tend to move up. So this is positive, okay? We want to see the VIX dropping. It's under the Ichimoku cloud, it's under the Tenkinsen, and under the Kijinsen. Excellent stuff. Let's go to the next ETF here. This is silver. Silver created a doji type candle right there. Typically what you want to wait for is for price to either get above here for continuation or if it gets under the low there to consider lessening your position, reducing your position size or even exiting if you've, you know, made a nice profit, you can do that and look for other opportunities. That's the way to look at it, you know. Uh, instead of looking at the indicators and whether they say that the indicator tells you it's overbought or oversold, Pay more attention to the actual candles. The candles will give you the signals first before all the other indicators are going to be lagging. All right. Uh, the Ichimoku, though, is pretty, uh, pretty good as far as uh, giving us buy points and sell points and finding resistance and support levels. All right. So so with silver, I'd just be holding at this point. How about BITO? This is the, the Bitcoin ETF. So on the ETF, it's, you can see it's down 1.26% today. It's created a negative pattern. It's a double candle pattern. It's called dark cloud cover. Uh, typically, when you have a red candle hovering above a positive bullish candle, that is a sign. And I'll show you what it looks like here. All right, when we look at our right here, double pattern, double candle patterns, dark cloud cover. There's the bullish candle. There's that red one that created a higher high than the prior high, but is dark, it's black or red in this case. So it's a negative candle. Now, uh, 
could this potentially lead to a, a downturn? Yeah, there's a higher probability now because of this pattern. On the so we'll see what happens. You know, it's also inside the cloud. This ETF, I've been recommending that people hold off on taking a long position until price gets above the cloud. Essentially, one of the rules of Ichimoku. The next ETF is utilities. Very strong, very strong. Look at how it's holding up above that $72 level that I had drawn back on. Let's see, when was that? May 10th, okay? About 11 days ago, I drew this level. I said, we needed to get above this level. Based on that reversal candle, we did it, but it's been hovering and just waiting here, but it's strong. I mean, it's it's doing well. Uh, we have a very bullish sector here, the utilities. It's up 0.9%. It's done better than most uh, sectors. Look at this on the weekly chart, for example. It's just been coming along. Now it's gonna find some resistance here. You can see that re uh, reversal candle right there. That goes back to December 16th of 2022. So we may find some resistance at 73, 79. That might be a good place to take some profits, maybe reduce your position in utility sector. Notice how far away we currently are from the Tenkinson. That's a big drop. And if we were to measure that, uh, we're talking about about, let's see here, we're about seven and a half percent away from Tankinson. But we don't have a reversal candle here. Everything is still looking bullish. And so I'm waiting for that reversal candle first before I, before I act on, on anything. IAK is the insurance index ETF. This one has stalled here at 117.60. You can see it came back down under, but it's still holding up above the Tankinson Kijinson. It's still bullish overall for me. XLP, this is consumer staples. Uh, we had, uh, you can see here, we were up 0.59% on the, let's look at that daily chart. Uh, we we're up 0.59% today. We had came, come down to the Tengensen. We basically had a nice little gap up right there. You can see it. Uh, if you look closely from this level here to that open, that was a nice little gap. And so I expect this to do better. This is a uh, also a very bullish pattern right here. This is called a uh, bullish Harami. Okay. And that one, show you real quick. When we look under bullish candle pattern reference sheet, which you can find on my Twitter page, by the way, if you look through the posts, uh, it's right here. Bullish Harami, a negative candle followed by a bullish candle that's smaller and within the prior body. That's something to watch, folks. Uh, so, th so what does that mean exactly? It means that there's a higher probability, not a 100% probability, but a higher than 50% probability that this ETF will go up tomorrow. That's, that's all it's really telling us. What, it, what it's essentially telling us is that the, there was a, uh, basically a, a battle between the, the bulls and the bears, and the bulls won right here. And they've, um, there's, a, there's a higher, like I said, they're in control. And when the bulls are in control, you want to be on the side of the bulls, basically. All right, XLF. And this whole market is a bull market. I mean, anybody that's telling you you should be out of the market right now, I mean, I'm sorry, you're wrong. Okay, this has been a very strong, just, okay, the chart doesn't lie. We're in a very strong uptrend. Yes, we found a little bit of resistance over here, but this is certainly not turned over yet. And the Ichimoku indicator is giving us the signals that this thing is still strong. The bullish cloud here in the future, right? Synchrospan A above Synchrospan B. Tenkinson is above the Kijinson. Price is above both moving averages. And one final thing, the Chiku span, that white line that you see right there, right, that's above price. That white line is essentially the closing prices in a line form projected 26 periods in the past. When that's above price, it's bullish. When it's under, like it was over here, it's bearish. All right. How about healthcare? <clears throat> okay, well, this is an interesting candle. This is a one of multiple reversal candles that have been forming in this area here. So what is that? What should we do about that? I mean, I'd be a little bit concerned right now. If price gets under this low here, it's more than likely to drop. Um, it may even drop if it gets under this low, but and closes under that level. Okay, so that's what I'd be watching. I think that's the key thing to, to look for right there is the, the low of this, um, oops, 
yeah, right there, the low of that candle there. And the low of that candle is 145.88. Otherwise, the healthcare sector has been recently doing really well. It broke above the cloud just recently, back on Wednesday, May 15th. That's very bullish. This is the beginning stages of an uptrend, all right? But we may have a pullback, which is totally natural and normal. Uh, on the weekly chart, you know, we're, we're above all the moving averages. We're still doing well. We've got some resistance at 148.20. All right, let's keep going here with U.S. dollar, UUP. The U.S. dollar um, is under the cloud on the weekly. Under the Tenkan Sen and Kijinsen on the daily, it's looking bearish. That's good for the market. We want this to be moving down. It helps to bolster the, the, the stock market up. Gold, down 0.15%, creating a reversal candle. I'll just circle that. Uh, I'd be watching that on the daily time frame. If you're, remember, it, it, you have to pick what um, time frame you want to be trading in. If you are a long-term investor, make your decisions based on the weekly charts. You can see right here. Let me just, I'm just curious to see something. Where's the high there? That high is 225.09. Let's type that in there. Okay. 225.09. We are at 224.23. Has not broken above that level. So it's not a buy point until we get above that level. On the daily time frame, we may have a little bit of a pullback, but it could just as easily pop above. I would just be holding at this point with gold. This is the Bitcoin US dollar. Um, so this one has, unlike the ETF, the BITO ETF, the Bitcoin US dollar has, in fact, you know, done pretty much better. Uh, you can see that it got above the tankings in here last week on May 17th, Friday of May 17th, and uh, is remaining above it. We had a very bullish few days here. On Friday, May 17th, it got closed above the cloud and it's been moving up. But today we got a bearish candle. We may get a little pullback possibly tomorrow. We'll see what happens with that. Okay, so let's take a look at energy XLE. This one has been stalling for a while. We are in a decline in energy. You can see that this low, this I'm sorry, this high here is lower than that high. And it looks like it's turning over here, potentially. Um, it could not, it broke above the cloud here temporarily on this date. Uh, th that was on May 17th, on Friday. And then it came right back into the cloud. And so right now it's not a, one of the more strong you know, sectors to be invested in. I would be you know, just holding off. Let's wait, to, let's get some confirmation on the ETF itself, the sector before adding any uh, long positions to the energy stocks. If you're considering buying energy stocks, I just wait for a bit. How about IFRA? This is the infrastructure ETF. This, on the other hand, is doing great. It, it just broke above this little box that you see right here. Whoops. Wrong uh, thingy there. Let's get that. There we go. See that little consolidation stage right there? It popped, closed up 0.4%. I expect this to do uh, to continue moving. It's uh, these are all doing really well on the on the weekly as well. Here's something that's not doing well. XLY on the weekly chart. Yes, it is above the the Tankinson, above the Kijinsen. Uh Everything looks good on the weekly. However, on the daily, we are inside the cloud. Looks like we're about to close above very soon though. This could become bullish maybe this week or next week. Um, we would need to close also, in my opinion, we would need to get above this level. Let's see what the high of that candle is right there. It is 180.28. Okay, that's a daily level. Looking at the daily chart right now. I would want it to get above 180.28. That will confirm to me that this is going to continue. It will certainly be above the cloud at that point. At that point, the single span A will also be moving up along with price. So that's what I'm waiting for. You can see the Chiku span just today, and uh, it looks like it closed above yesterday, the price. See the closing price, if you look closely, the white line there closed above the closing price of the candle. That was bullish. So it's looking good. We've got a bullish engulfing pattern here. 
but we're stuck inside the cloud. And one of the rules is you don't want to be entering a long position when price is inside the cloud. And uh, certain, we certainly want to get above this resistance level of 180.28. Real estate is another sector that hasn't done particularly well um, in the in the near you know this past future here. You can see on the weekly chart. We don't have confirmation here. We've got the Tenkinson is still under the Kijinson. We need the green line to be above the red line. That's the faster moving average. We don't have that. Based on that alone, I wouldn't be entering a long position in real estate. It does look good in the daily though. We finally got a bullish candle above the cloud, but the cloud itself is not bullish yet. One of the rules of Ichimoku is that you want the Senku Span A, that lighter colored uh, line there, to be above the Senku Span B, the purple one. And we don't, we're not there yet, so I'd hold off. Much better opportunities in other sectors. And when there's better opportunities, why focus on any of those subpar sectors? That's the way you got to look at it. Now, technology doing really well this week, right? We... This week, you'd see we're above the 1235 level on the weekly chart and on the daily chart. It's looking strong. I like technology right now. Materials on the weekly chart doing strong. It's three weeks above the tank is in, looking good on the daily time frame. We're in a consolidation zone. You may want to hold off until we uh, get above, you know, these candles here. Like that level is about 92. 60 or so. All right. That's what I'd be looking for. Okay. Let's go. Industrials. This one closed on the daily time frame under the Tenkinson, so I'd hold off on this stock. Otherwise, the pattern itself looks good. The Ichimoku indicator is bullish, but you want confirmation with price above the Tenkinson. That would be a buy signal if we get a bullish candle tomorrow. Um, and ideally you want to get above 126.39. See how many times it's found resistance there? It's, you know, th it, there's a reason for it. You know, prices being, you know, contr basically controlled right there. Um, once it breaks through that level, you, you'll feel more confident about, you know, the move continuing. XHB is home builders. This one price is under the Tankinson. I hold off on that one. Semiconductors. Uh, looks bullish overall, but remember tomorrow we're getting the earnings on NVIDIA, so I'd hold off on buying this ETF until we we know what's going to happen with that with uh, NVIDIA first. Copper, down day today, down 1.92%. Um, but overall, look at the weekly chart. Now, it's been in a very strong uptrend. This candle is still forming. It hasn't finished yet. We still have a few days, right? So um, on the daily time frame, would I be exiting a position based on what I'm seeing here? No. Okay, this is not uh, your typical reversal candle right here. Uh, we don't have like a long wick on the top. We don't have, it's not a spinning top. It's just basically a down day, in my opinion. The ADX is still looking very strong. Notice how that's still moving up. So the momentum is still strong. It's just a down day. That's all. All right, let's... Um all right. Well, I'm going to keep this video short, actually. We're going to just take a look at our subscribers. Well, one of our subscribers requests trip.com, T-C-O-M. Okay, this stock, let's look at the weekly chart. Weekly chart, you can see very bullish as far as the price being above the moving averages in the cloud. ADX is moving up. It's a, in a very strong uptrend. I wouldn't pay too much attention to this candle yet because it's only Tuesday, has not formed yet. On the daily time frame, also looking extremely bullish. We just had a little pullback here, found support at Tenkinson, and the buyers stepped in towards the end of the day. Um, how do I know that? I can just look at this candle and say, all right, the price, okay, the price opened right there. It closed here. It shows, the wig shows us how far down the price went. So it came down to this level during the day, but the buyers stepped in before the close and pushed it up. And if I switch it to a, let's say 10 minute chart, you could see that. See how towards the end of the day, 
the buyers. So here was the opening price, the closing price from the previous day. So it, it came down, down to this level, 54.62, stayed about that way, and then just towards the, around, I would say, uh, let's see, what was that, around 1.50 p.m. or so? You know, you could see that it moved up about 1% from that level. Um, and so, yeah, I like it. I like the stock. I, I wouldn't be entering a long position until we get uh, a new position in this one until you get above the high of that candle, though, of 56.49, just to be safe. So when you see a red candle, you never want to be entering a long position on red candles. Wait for that first green one. Here was a red candle, for example. We get the, the green. We get the green light on this candle. That would have been a good place to enter a long position. And there's really no reason to be exiting at this point because we're very close to the Tenkins in here. Uh, we're not far away from those levels. If we if we had received like one of these types of candles up here, and it was like you know maybe a eight percent or ten percent, you know from away from the Tenkins in, that's when you consider exiting or reducing your position. But we're not overextended. We're just moving, you know, in a very uh, steady kind of way in an uptrend. Guys, that's going to do it. Now, if you if you for those of you who have not subscribed to the channel, it doesn't cost anything. It's free to subscribe. You'll see a subscribe button in the bottom right hand corner of your page um, and the video. Definitely click on that subscribe. And that way, these videos will pop up in your algorithm in the future. So you can like, you know, you can also do the notification bell so that you know when my videos pop up and uh, hit the like button if you guys like what you're seeing and you're learning some stuff. All right. I'll catch you all in the next video.